50 years ago today, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean left the surface of the moon to dock with Dick Gordon and begin their journey home. This was the second time humans had landed on the moon. Today, we will be learning all about Pete Conrad, the crew, and the mission of Apollo 12. While their mission was very successful, it began with quite a shock. The Apollo 12 mission was a very interesting one. It was the second mission to the moon, and it was launched uh, from Cape Canaveral during some cloudy weather. Three, two, one. As the rocket ascended into space off the ground, it had this enormous plume of flame coming out of the engines, which created an, a path of electrical conductivity, like a lightning rod. The rocket, therefore, conducted electricity and received a couple of very, very big lightning jolts, which knocked out essentially all the signals on the command module. Everything either went blank or turned red. Things were just completely shut down. But the guidance system in the instrument unit was designed to be rugged enough to handle situations like that. It kept working. They made it into orbit. Once they were in orbit, they were able to reset all the circuit breakers and realign the gyros on board. They went to the moon and had one of the most successful missions of the entire Apollo program. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm an educator here at the National Air and Space Museum. It is my pleasure to host this discussion today as part of our What's New in Aerospace program brought to you by Boeing. Uh, I'm joined by the National Air and Space Museum's uh, space history curator, Dr. Tiesel Muir Harmony, and the wife of Apollo 12 Commander Pete Conrad, Nancy Conrad. Thank you both so much for joining us. Those of you in the audience and those of you watching online, we will be taking questions, so be sure to think of some. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, I want to start with Teasel. Teasel, do you want to tell us a little bit about what the mission of Apollo 12 was? Sure, so um, as you hopefully all remember, Apollo 11 successfully landed on the moon uh, in July 1969, and then a few months later, uh, it was Apollo 12's job to um, increase the precision of the landing, so be more precise in, in, in where they landed, as well as to undertake a more extensive scientific program on the moon. And it's sometimes referred to as the forgotten mission. Why is that? <laughs> There are a few reasons. One, um, Kennedy had set a very clear finish line, which was send humans to the moon, return them safely back to Earth before the end of the decade. And that finish line had been crossed. A lot of people stopped what they were doing in July to follow that flight. Um, and this was the, this in many ways felt like the second time. So that would always, you know, it, it's to be expected a slightly less attention. But also November of 1969 was, um, it was a month when there were many things making headlines. So the um, My Lai massacre uh, was, was first written about at that time. So that had happened in, in 1968, in the spring of 1968. But um, uh, journalists uncovered that story and, and published about it two days before the launch. And then the images first came out um, actually 50 years ago today. Uh, this was a huge news story um, and uh, quite shocking. And there were other things as well. So, so Nixon was focused on um, arms limitation agreements with the Soviet Union. Um, Alcatraz was being occupied by American Indians. Uh, there was a huge protest in Washington, the largest at that time, uh, 500,000 people uh, protesting the Vietnam War. So it was, there were so many other things going on that month um, that were grabbing people's attention. But that didn't mean that they were not having fun on the moon. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, the crew had a great time, and many people did follow the flight, not only in the U.S., but around the world. And Nancy, you were married to Pete from 1990 until his death in 1999. Okay. Tell us a little bit about Pete Conrad. Uh, the person? <laughs> Pete was a character. Um, I used to say, and I still maintain, that if you were having a party, and you wanted everybody to have a good time, you would invite Pete Conrad. He was a great storyteller. He was a very humble, uh, personable guy, and he was fun. And he had just this bubbling, charismatic, electric personality. I, I used to say he could turn the lights on, and he really could. 
His motto was, if you can't be good, be colorful. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how did he live this? Well, he was both. Um, he, he was a happy-go-lucky guy. He felt very lucky to have been able to do the things that he got to do. Part of that is, you know, we all are, are our stories, our histories, where we come from, our childhoods. And Pete felt very, very fortunate to be able to fly four flights in space and nail a pinpoint landing on the moon on Apollo 12 and then go on to fly Skylab. And I'm sure we'll talk about that going forward. But when you look at his youth, um, he was a kid who had a problem reading and spelling. And he was at a very prestigious school. And in those days, they didn't know what dyslexia was. And so he was flunking just about everything. And he had dug a hole, a tunnel under this school so he could escape every day to get on his Indian motorcycle and get over to Paoli Airfield so he could mow the lawn to earn flying time. So they threw him out of the school and in the 11th grade. Now this can really spoil your whole day, right? So his mom ended up finding this little school in upstate New York that had a reputation for being really great with problem kids, and Pete was turning into a problem child. Uh, he was a, a rowdy boy at those days. And he, she took him to this school, and the headmaster at this school saw something special in him. And eternally grateful to that headmaster because it changed the trajectory of Pete's life. He, uh, the headmaster took Pete under his wing, and Pete was learning to fly at this time, and Pete ended up with a scholarship to Princeton. Yeah, so here's a kid, he's expelled, goes to a different school, an educator takes him under his wing, he ends up with a scholarship to Princeton. And the scholarship was compliments of the Navy and Princeton. He became an aeronautical engineer, two very good reasons. He liked to fly, and he didn't have to read or spell. So then he went on to become a test pilot, and that's how he got engaged with the Apollo program and the Gemini program. And you, after his death, created the Conrad Foundation to, right. to honor his memory. Tell us a little bit about how you're honoring that memory sure. and what the foundation does. Sure. So Pete's story is really the story of the intersection of education, innovation, and entrepreneurship, because after he flew in space and the four missions that he was part of, he went on to work in the aerospace industry and toward the end of his life, he had created next generation rockets to take us, his, his concept was from California to Italy in 45 minutes flying in low earth orbit and he had created four companies to do that. So really the whole framework for the commercialization and privatization of space, what Branson, Musk and Bezos are doing today actually really stands on the shoulders of Pete. And so the education piece is the story I just shared with you, how this educator took a young man under his wing. And the entrepreneurship piece was the, um, the commercialization and privatization of space. And that took great innovation and invention at the same time. So I thought, well, how could we honor those pieces of Pete that were so transformative and how lucky he was that someone took him under his wing. That's what we're going to do. We'll take kids under our wing and we'll give them their moonshot. And I'm a teacher. So I've worked my whole life on how to transform the way young people learn. We call it pull education. You know, the classroom is a lot of push. Learn this, take a test. If you make it better, you win. We decided let's invite students to design the future by creating products to solve global and local challenges. That's how it all fit together. So it's my passion for education, Pete's story and his legacy merged together. And for the last 14 years, we've been hosting the Conrad Challenge. And students come from all over the world, all over the United States, and everywhere from Australia to Zimbabwe and everything in between. And it's all on the internet. And everyone can participate as long as they're 13 to 18 and form a team from two to five students. And can you tell us uh, about one of these really creative teams? Uh -huh. and, and 
<coughs> I know I've I've looked at the mm -hmm. <laughs> there are a lot of them. Yeah. But is there is there one store I I know that you've just recruited a team from Zimbabwe mm -hmm. um, and that there have been some other teams that have come up with some really creative really creative things. There's so many of them. I mean over the years there's thousands of these. Many of our all of our students that come to our summit file provisional patents and the students own their IP, we don't own it, and they can do whatever they want with it. Some of them go on to full patent. Um, one project I particularly am reminded of is a team of students out of Florida. They created a portable, low-cost water purification system. It's now in nine countries, and it's in a birthing clinic in Nigeria. And babies used to come out of the womb washed in dirty water. And because of these young people, they're now washed in clean water. Um, there's systems for stopping hand tremors. There's one team of kids created a way to stop forest fires using sound. Don't ask me how it works. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, they've had systems to find missing objects on ISS, on the International Space Station. Yeah, I know, because we've had astronauts in that say, well, Whenever you walk into one of the modules and you see an astronaut doing this, you know that something has floated Float away. away. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. they don't know where it yeah. goes. So our kids created a way to find that. And actually, uh, NASA Goddard uh, gives our students unused patents that they may use to develop their product ideas. Oh, wow. And I think that that system came out of one of those unused patents. So it's all over the place. Our kids work in aerospace, energy, cybersecurity, health, smoke-free world and ed tech, they're creating technologies for use in the classroom. What a concept. The consumer <laughs> is creating for the consumer. consumer. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I want to remind everybody that we will be taking questions. If you have a question, uh, please put it in the comments section online. If you're here in the audience, we will be taking some questions, so think about that. Uh, Teasel, tell us about the other two crew members on Apollo 12. Well, one of, the, one of the sort of wonderful parts about the story of Apollo 12 is that all of these guys were good friends, and they were friends before um, they were even astronauts. So they were all in the Navy. They were naval aviators. And, um, and Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon were actually roommates, I believe, um, when, when they were in the Navy on an um, aircraft carrier. And so they had a, a wonderful rapport. Um, we're good, we're good friends and joked around a lot. And, um, and you can, if you listen to the, the audio from the mission, you can, you can hear that they, they knew each other well, they appreciated each other, and they understood each other's sense of humor. So, um, so Dick Gordon uh, was also a, a Gemini astronaut, like um, Pete Conrad. They actually flew in a mission together, um, Gemini 11. And um, Al Bean um, is, uh, I think, a great thing to remember about him is that he was an artist as well and, and produced a lot of incredible work, was able to capture that experience of being an astronaut um, in his paintings. Can I add something to that? So C.C. Williams was on the original crew of Apollo 12, and C.C. was killed shortly before the mission. And Al had been in training, and Pete chose Al as the lunar landing module pilot. Why? because Al was a detail guy. Oh my gosh, he could remember everything. And Pete was not, he was a detail guy, but not like Alan Bean. And it was actually Alan Bean that knew where the switch was that would reboot the computer that w had failed and actually died. They were flying a dead rocket to the moon. And so John Aaron at, at Mission Control knew which switch to push. And in fact, you can buy t-shirts. <laughs> it's S SRB to AUX, is that correct? Um, S-C-E. S-C-E to, to Ox. Ox. I always mess that up. <laughs> S-C-E to Ox. You can buy the t-shirt. Um, it's no big deal. But um, that's how they rebooted it. And because Alan knew where it was. And this is after the lightning strike. After the lightning strike. I mean, can you imagine they had been training for, you know, one caution and warning light, two caution. The whole thing lit up like a Christmas tree. And when Pete was afraid, he would giggle. And if you listen to the voice tapes of this, when they got struck by lightning, Pete's laughing. It wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was scared. Yeah. Well, you knew the three out astronauts yeah. outside of the sure. mission. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how uh, they were? You know, they were like, uh, so this was the ultimate adventure of three best friends. And can you imagine getting to go to the moon with your two best pals? 
I mean, they giggled, they had good times. Whenever the, all of us were around each other, um, and there were many times where we were at events and things like that, and they were at our house many times. We spent Thanksgivings together. They just, they, you know, you could tell how much love they had for each other. And in those days, having a male friendship that, that was that close was very, very unusual. I think today men have actually learned how to speak to each other mm -hmm. and be with each other and be friends with each other. It was very rare back in those days. They were friends their entire lives. And the story I absolutely love the most, there's two stories, and if it's okay, I'll just share those Go stories. Ahead. Okay. So, so <laughs> they were also characters. Don't forget, if you can't be good, be colorful. <laughs> so, so Pete and Al had tucked away a tripod, and they were going to take the world's first selfie from the lunar surface. And they were going to put their camera, their Hasselblad that was on their suit, and mount it onto the tripod and take a picture of themselves on the moon. And of course, NASA would go crazy, as would the entire world, because there's no way you could take a picture of two people. There were only two people on the lunar surface. <laughs> so they got all of their, they took a whole group of uh, science missions to the moon. It was called the ALSAP. Take a look at it on the, on the internet. <laughs> so they get all done, they pack up everything, they're getting ready to get back into the lab for the ascent to rendezvous with, with the command module, and they can't find the tripod, and they're like hysterical, they can't find it. And their heart rates shoot up, and they're sweating, and, and they're running around, and of course, headquarters and the command center doesn't know anything what's going on, and they're getting very, very worried about Pete now. They never did find the tripod. So when they got back to Johnson Space Center, at, there it was in the rock box where they had <laughs> had 78 pounds of rock stowed away. So because Al Bean was a painter, he painted that. He actually painted all three of them on the lunar surface. So the selfie became a painting. That's how big a characters they were and how much they enjoyed each other's company. So Pete and, and uh, Alan, there's two amazing stories. One is, when they were on the back side of the moon, there is no dark side, people. There is a back side, there is a far side. So Pete looked over at Al, and they were out of calm with NASA and with Houston, and he said, hey, Al, do you want to fly this thing? Which Al did. There was no safety <laughs> risk or anything else. Pete just wanted him to have that, that jazz, that <laughs> opportunity, the fun of it. And then they rendezvoused with the command module, Dick Gordon had been circling around, and they got in there and they were covered in lunar dust. I mean, just covered in it. They were filthy. <laughs> and Dick Gordon looks down and he says, you guys aren't coming in my clean, sweet, and pretty <laughs> command module wearing all that lunar dirt. So they stripped off everything, and Pete looked it out and he said, well, if something happens and we go out of the planet, we're going to go out exactly the same way we came in. <laughs> there they were, bare naked in the command module. They were characters. They were characters. <laughs> they had fun. Uh, Teasel, Pete went back into space after Apollo 12. Do you want to tell us about what that mission was? Sure. That was um, uh, part of the Skylab program, so Skylab 2. Uh, Skylab was the, the first American space station, and there were three crewed missions. Uh, Pete was on the first one. So he was in space for 28 days, and uh, the next two missions were about two months and then three months. Um, and it was testing long duration space flight, as well as a lot of uh, important scientific research, um, uh, especially solar research and Earth observation. Uh, but they did some really tricky maneuvers as well. So when Skylab was launched, um, uh, it, it was damaged. And so part of the Skylab 2's responsibility was um, to uh, make sure that the, the space station could be cooled off to a livable temperature, as well as um, to, to free up the, um, the solar array. Uh, and so they were able to do that and um, lived in space for, for 28 days. So he was part of that mission after um, the Apollo 12 mission. And he, and he fixed the, the, part, the damage? Yes, damage. they were able to fix it and, and make it a, not only a successful mission, but also um, a su su successful space station. So this was uh, 1973. Uh, Nancy, what was Pete's favorite mission? Was it Apollo or Skylab? It was Skylab. Um, Pete was a Mr. Fix-It. He was a tinkerer. 
And, and I have so much admiration for young people who tinker, because somewhere in one of those is, is a Michael Dell, is a Pete Conrad. In fact, we're doing a project with Dell now that, that is working with tinkers. Pete liked to build things. He used to take them apart so he could put them back together. Um, he built a little elevator to take the orange juice up to his room so he wouldn't have to go down in the morning. <laughs> he built radio sets. Then he ended up designing and working on the LEM and then building next generation rockets. And all those things are what tinkers could do. It was his favorite, favorite flight because it taxed him the most. And he loved to do things that were challenging. So the solar array was stuck. It had, you know, the solar array is what kept the Skylab, which was our first space station, cool, and it was cooking. And so they launched in two phases. The lab went up, and then the uh, rendezvous with the next mission, which was the Skylab 2. So they had tested all sorts of very fancy equipment to release this metal clasp that was around the solar array. Very fancy things. So what they ended up using, and they tested this in the water in, in um, what's the place? Oh, in Alabama, Huntsville. So Rusty Schweikert's in the water and they're testing all these things. They used a shepherd's crook. You probably don't know what it is, but that's what they used to repair phone poles with. So it was a yanking tool. So Pete's up there, he's tied to a tether inside the Saturn V and he's tied to a tether, and he's out doing a spacewalk, and P.S., Pete had height fright. He could not go out on the balcony of a 10-story building, <laughs> but he could hang out there on, on, a, on the edge of a nothing, and he's yanking on this thing, and it finally cuts loose, and the solar array opens up, and he said he flew backwards, and the only thing that went through his mind was, Ooh, I could be the first arrow ever launched in space, <laughs> and I hope this <laughs> tether holds, and it did. So, and they had a blast in Skylab. They really had a great time. It was a, it was really a sophisticated hotel for them compared to the Gemini vehicles, which were like sardine cans. This was huge, and they used to have the the Skylab 500. They would do races around the thing because you know you could run around. Space has no up, down, side to side. So you think about the geometry and the size of the thing, it grows exponentially if there is no up and down. Yeah, so I had a blast in there. <laughs> Teasel, tell us a little bit about the importance of the Skylab missions. Uh, Skylab was extremely important for scientific research, especially solar observation. It, it really was um, a major contributor to the sort of the flourishing of that field and, and scientists started to focus much more on um, solar observation after that, especially from outside uh, the Earth's atmosphere, um, from space, and um, also for Earth observation. But it was an important precursor to um, the International Space Station as well. So we learned a lot about living and working in space, you know, um, uh, exercising in space and the importance of um, keeping your, your, your muscles strong uh, during long duration space flight, the larger ramifications of that. If you don't, um, what it's like to live in space that long. I think um, at that time, we, the missions to the moon were so much shorter. Um, uh, Apollo 12, for instance, about 10 days. Um, and so living in space for 28 days or two months or three time. months, um, there was a lot to learn. Well, and it was the first medical doctor ever in space. Dr. Joe Kerwin was on Pete's Skylab crew, and they really began to understand the effects of space flight on the human oh, body. Yeah. Um, it was very early days of that, and as you know now, I mean, that has become a very, very important part of thinking about long duration and exploration space flight. Yep. We have time for a question. If anyone has one, if they want to go to the microphone, we'll try and get to that. <clears throat> so at the Johnson Space... Oh, we have a question. Oh, we do. We've got a question here. Yes. God, it's going to be a stumper, I can <laughs> tell. <laughs> how did Pete, how did Pete um, reconcile being such a maverick with working in such structured environments as the Navy and then NASA? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think that the discipline of the Navy was very important to Pete to learn that discipline 
and to understand how the buck stops here kind of philosophy and to take responsibility. His first commander on his first um, uh, deployment was Altadeo. Altadeo was one of the original Blue Angels and was a lifelong friend of ours. And I think that when you have a maverick spirit, having the discipline at the same time helps you to understand the balance between your, your fun, your energy, and your joy of life with how important your decisions are and how meaningful what you say can become. So, Thank did that answer you? Yep. Good. Yeah. Was Pete upset that he was not the first person to walk on the moon? You know, Pete was a happy-go-lucky guy. Um, someone asked me the other day, I was at an event at the California Science Center, and they had seen Pete pacing by mission control back and forth and back and forth when, when the Apollo 11 flight flew, and he said, I could just imagine Pete thinking to himself, gee, it wasn't me that was first. He, he was just happy. He was so happy to be part of this, and, you know, because here's a kid that gets thrown out of school and he gets a moonshot. Oh, <laughs> man, that was heaven to him. So you know, he just was happy. We have another question. Pete and the other astronauts always seem to be in such good, good spirits and, and like, optimistic and, and very task-oriented when they had some troubles. Were, did he ever share with you any time that, that they really had a little bit of sense of fear during one of their missions or in a life experience? Well, as I mentioned to you, Pete giggled when they got struck by lightning. <laughs> he was pretty scared, I'm sure. You know, they all had a real respect for the danger that they were subjecting themselves to, and they, you know, was advised consent, so they knew that this was going to be hairy stuff. Um, I saw him, well, I'll share a personal story with you. Pete and I flew a helicopter from Arizona to Venezuela. And we had a, a life raft in the back, and we're taking off over water. And I look down in the water, and I see the shadow of us. We looked like a little mosquito. Oh, jeez. And, <laughs> and I looked at Pete, and I said, are you afraid? I said, have you ever flown over water in a helicopter? He owned the world speed record, and I think it still stands in a helicopter. And, and I said, have you, yeah, are, have you ever done this before? No. And I said, well, are you afraid? kind of flying over water and you've never done this before? And he said, yeah, sure, I'm afraid. I went, oh my God, what <laughs> am I doing here? You know, it's me and him in this hell. I think he had such respect for the vehicle and the way he would walk around airplanes. We, we had an airplane, he would always do the walk around. He did the walk around of his motorcycle before he went on his motorcycle trips. And the healthy respect for that marriage between man and machine was embedded in him, and I think it was embedded in all the guys that flew and all the pilots that fly today. When you go, I was very happy to see when I took off from Seattle on Sunday, I saw the pilot do the walk around of the airplane. Sometimes you don't notice that, people, but it's really important to see the respect of the man and the machine. I, uh, I'll, I can add a story to that please. as well from um, Gemini 11, and I think it, it sort of speaks to this relationship you were talking about. So. Um, Dick Gordon was scheduled to do a spacewalk during that mission, and okay. he had been instructed that if there was a problem, mm. that he had to he had to close the hatch and come home alone. And I think he was he was afraid of that possibility yeah. because of um, his sense of friendship and duty, yeah. and uh. did not want that to happen. So it wasn't as much about you know um, the larger mission or the spacecraft, but it was about, it was about having to lose his friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was about people. At the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, they have a grove of trees mm. that is uh, a memorial grove for astronauts. Mm -hmm. And every Christmas, they are decorated with white lights yes. except one. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us sure. how that came about? Yeah, <laughs> it's a sweet story. So this is Pete's tree. We were there dedicating the tree after Pete died in a motorcycle accident July 8, 1999, and the tree was planted thereafter. And his dear friend Al Bean was speaking at that dedication. And the story goes like this. Al stood up there and said, you know, in his sweet southern accent, I just didn't know what to say. 
And I woke up in the middle of the night and there was Pete standing at the end of the bed and he told me what I should say today. And what Pete said was, you know, Al, my motto is if you can't be good, be colorful. And I know they're going to put white lights on all these trees, but on my tree, I want colorful lights. So please ask George Abbey, who was the director of <laughs> Johnson Space Center at the time, to please put colored lights on my tree. So there you are. Every year, Pete's tree has red lights and all the rest and are white. NASA still honors they that. They still honor it every year. And every year, that's our Christmas card from our foundation <laughs> to all of our students and teachers and parents and, and supporters worldwide. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us today. We are unfortunately out of time. I also want to thank Boeing for sponsoring the program. If you still have questions, um, in 30 minutes, we'll be back up here uh, doing a mission debrief for STEM and 30 with both Nancy and Teasel. Um, and I want to send you all out today uh, just as a reminder as we come upon uh, the holiday season that if you can't be good, <laughs> be colorful. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thank you.